Hi, I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of The National Interest. And I am speaking today with Dimitri K. Symes, the president of the Center for the National Interest. We're going to discuss Ukraine, Russia, and American foreign policy. Dimitri, today in the New York Times, Thomas Friedman has a column called Putin Blinked. And he was just saying that Putin is retreating in the Ukraine and that this is, in fact, a victory for the U.S. and a severe defeat for Russia. Is Putin, in fact, blinking? I think Putin is blinking. Uh, but I think that he is blinking because uh, earlier he was bluffing. By that I mean I see very little evidence that Putin had a serious plan to take over eastern and southern Ukraine. Uh, it would be very costly for Russia economically. Uh, it would uh, be uh, very provocative, not only vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States and the European Union, but also uh, many countries friendly to Russia, including China, uh, would not approve something so drastic. And uh, last but not least, uh, they do remember the Soviet Union being absorbed in Afghanistan for a number of years. It was a very destructive war in terms of Soviet interests. And uh, I'm sure that if uh, Putin sends, uh, would send tanks into Ukraine, uh, they would be pretty soon at the Polish and the Romanian border. But that, of course, would not be the end of the story. And uh, I think that Putin made uh, a lot of uh, provocative and uh, intimidating pronouncements. But at the end, he was not prepared to act. Uh, but Tom Friedman, I think, is wrong, because this is not uh, an end of the game. It is not even an end of the chapter. Uh, there are tactical maneuvers on both sides. And uh, people with uh, uh, Tom Friedman's mindset, uh, they do think that if uh, Putin has retreated, it means that you can uh, uh, run him uh, all the way into the corner. And uh, I hope that we would not be uh, that we would not be surrendering to this temptation, because we may not like at all Putin's response. What is your analysis of the new leader of the Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko? Well, uh, he seems to be half Ukrainian oligarch, half uh, Bashir Assad. Uh, by that I mean uh, he came from that group of uh, people called the oligarchs uh, who were major beneficiaries of uh, lawless 90s, both uh, in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, he uh, uh, is a man who was on all sides of Ukrainian politics. He is not a radical, he is not a, a fanatic, uh, but he has this kind of uh, winner-all mindset, which is so typical for these people who were able <coughs> in the 1990s to accumulate enormous fortunes and to exercise a great political uh, influence. And these are not people who are used to playing uh, by the rules. And the reason I have uh, uh, compared him to Bashir Assad is because obviously the Obama administration is making a, a, a great deal out of uh, Bashir Assad using uh, uh, tanks Air Force uh, against his own people. And uh, it was uh, a kind of conduct uh, which led President Obama to establish his first red line in Syria and uh, to say that Bashir Assad had to go. Now you see President-elect Poroshenko talking about using even more air attacks and armor attacks on his own people uh, in eastern Ukraine. And what is President Obama's response? Good deed. Uh, this is not, this is not a, a, a contradiction in Obama's mind, because as long as somebody has a blessing of the Obama administration, that person, by definition, is on the right side of history. I'm not sure that everybody, however, would act on the basis of this definition. Certainly not Putin, and probably not the Chinese. In his foreign policy speech today at West Point, President Obama 
tried to enunciate a new American foreign policy that he said would go between the forces of isolationism and interventionism. And one of the things that he cited as a success for the United States in saying that we didn't need to act militarily, he claimed that the sanctions had helped win, carry the day in Ukraine. Do you agree? Absolutely not. Uh, the easiest thing uh, to avoid is uh, a thing that your uh, adversaries are not planning to do anyway. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger were very successful during the India-Pakistani war back uh, in 1970 in preventing uh, Indian attack on uh, uh, Pakistani mainland. Uh, we now know from a lot of documents that such an attack was never seriously uh, contemplated. Uh, uh, the Indians wanted uh, to remove Pakistani control from what now is known as Bangladesh. That was the plan. That is what they were able to do. And that is where they have stopped. Putin wants to take over Crimea. He has done it. He obviously wants to have more influence over Ukraine. Uh, how much influence he is going to have still remains to be seen, but I think that sanctions, which so far were rather symbolic and mostly for American domestic consumption, were probably not a serious factor in Putin's decision-making. One of the things that Obama said at the beginning of his speech today is that America has never been more powerful and that it really doesn't face any threats that it can't manage. But is the, what the Soviet Union used to call the correlation of forces moving against the United States, and I mean specifically the agreement that Putin signed with the Chinese a few days ago, do you see that as a dangerous trend or one that the United States does not need to worry about? Well, I think that the president is right in one respect. The United States clearly today is the only superpower uh, not only superpower in the military sense, but obviously an economic superpower. The United States has a real and strong system of alliances, and American democratic ideals have an appeal in most parts of the world. So uh, in this sense, obviously, uh, President Obama was right talking about uh, American uh, world leadership. Having said that, I think that uh, uh, Obama's speech was very simplistic. It basically was a response to his domestic critics. He used his uh, commencement at West Point essentially to deliver a campaign speech, uh, almost totally devoid of a serious foreign policy analysis. And uh, what was uh, revealing is that he now uh, began talking about the United States being a, an indispensable nation. Uh, mind you, when he started as president, he was explaining that, of course, the United States is indispensable and exceptional, but, of course, other nations also considered themselves indispensable and exceptional. It was a kind of a humble and analytical approach to world politics. Today, uh, Obama has uh, essentially adopted foreign policy rhetoric of uh, uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, one of the worst secretaries of state in American history, in my view. Mind you, it was she who began talking about uh, the United States being an indispensable nation to uh, justify U.S. intervention in the Balkans. And it was that intervention, more than anything else, that turned Russia uh, into an American adversary and has contributed to nationalist trends in Russia and to authoritarian trends in Russia. Uh, moreover, uh, this uh, uh, estrangement uh, with Russia at the end of 1990s has contributed to 9-11, to U.S. inability to work uh, uh, with Russia on a common threat of terrorism. And such cooperation uh, was being built at that time, and it was literally abandoned by both sides because of uh, uh, Clinton's uh, uh, adventures in the Balkans which were very much provoked by Madeleine Albright. And that's what Barack Hussein Obama is coming back today as a model for American foreign policy conduct. Again, the West Point speech, in my view, was campaign rhetoric, 
not a serious foreign policy analysis. When you speak of an adversarial relationship with Russia, is there a chance for a rapprochement between Moscow and Washington now that Putin does seem to be taking a more cautious stance in Ukraine? Russia is not a superpower. Russia has uh, considerably more limited strategic interests than the United States. Russia uh, is integrated into the world economy. And while uh, it can move into the Chinese direction, and is already moving in the Chinese direction, they obviously <coughs> don't want to find themselves in a situation when they are Beijing's junior partner. So I do think that it is possible to make a deal with Putin, and uh, this deal would include uh, an independent Ukraine, sovereign Ukraine without Crimea, but otherwise independent and sovereign, and uh, clearly moving in the Euro-Atlantic direction. But such Ukraine would have to make a commitment not to be a part of NATO. Such Ukraine would have to agree not to have American military infrastructure on its territory. And that Ukraine uh, would need not to look like an immediate military threat to Russia. And uh, President-elect Poroshenko, in my view, is basically a pragmatic man. But his pragmatic calculations, obviously, like for most oligarchs, uh, are based on a very simple question. What is that that I can get away with? And if he gets a sense from Washington and Brussels uh, that he uh, can walk on water, that obviously is going to affect his attitude to Russia. And he easily may become uh, too aggressive for his own good. We already had one president like that in Eastern Europe. His name was Mikhail Saakashvili, and he started a war against Russia, which he has lost. And what is important for President Obama is to indicate very clearly to Mr. Poroshenko that the United States supports independent Ukraine, that the United States is not just opposed, but will fight Russian uh, attempts to control Ukrainian destiny, but at the same time, if uh, Poroshenko wants to be a successful president, it's important for him to learn how to work with Russia. And today it means to work with Mr. Putin. And the winner-takes-all approach would be very counterproductive for Ukraine and for European security. Dmitry, final question. You mentioned NATO. Does Putin have a long-term strategy or wish to exercise more influence in the Baltic states or even to break up NATO, say, in the next five years by demonstrating that it is incapable of defending the Baltic states? I think that uh, if uh, President Obama was uh, more uh, deliberate and more thoughtful in handling the Ukrainian situation, Crimea would still belong to Ukraine. I think it was a combination of Obama's overall uh, perceived weakness and uh, his administration very provocative, intrusive conduct in Ukrainian politics uh, that led to a situation when there was uh, no legitimate government in Ukraine, and yet uh, Mr. Uh, Friedman indicates today it looked like Putin has blinked. It looked like he has blinked uh, last uh, February, uh, accepting uh, that uh, Yanukovych would be removed from power and that Ukraine would become essentially a Western domain. Several weeks after this perception that uh, Putin blinked, they have taken over Crimea. I think that if we play our cards right, Baltic states would be quite secure. I think that Ukraine would stay as an independent pro-Western country. But I repeat, if we uh, think that uh, this is the time to humiliate Putin, we would find ourselves on the wrong side of the Russian nation. We would provoke the wrath of the Russian people. And if somebody thinks that this is unimportant, let me say the obvious. 
uh, that uh, Russian tanks can take over Estonia in a matter of hours, and it would be a fait accompli. It may be an enormously expensive adventure for Russia, but European and world politics would not be the same, and we should not be playing games with contingencies like that. Dmitry Symes, thank you for this excellent conversation. Jacob, thank you so much for the opportunity.